Isn't God good? Say amen. I'm excited that what Lord is doing in our church uh, here with our people. I had the uh, opportunity to visit my father this past week, who is, most of you know, and I believe my mom is actually watching right now down in Florida, um, is dealing with the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's. And one of the things that is so encouraging for me to know that so many of you are praying for my mom and my dad and have never gone through this. This is new territory for me. And I've watched some of you go through it with family members. Some of you have given me some great counsel and advice, and I appreciate that. And uh, I want you to pray for Pat Ayers, my mom, for my brother who still lives in Jacksonville, Florida. That's where I'm from. And, uh, and I will be able to make my way down there. I'll have a I, I'll try to get down three, maybe four times a year. I've set up a little home office there, but I have to work some work. As a, and trying to go on a Monday through Friday, uh, praise the Lord for Southwest Airlines. The no drama, find your own seat airlines, praise the Lord. And they have a great deal there, and it's uh, worked out really well. Between that and Uber, I'm able to make it to my parents' house and back safely. So I wanted to open up by saying that, and uh, you do not know, you have no clue what it's like to come back to a church like this with the first thing that I heard this morning is how's your dad doing? How's your mom doing? How's your brother doing? And I have another brother in Atlanta, Mike Ayers as well, who's been able to help out. And uh, that's what a church family's about. And we try to love on each other, help each other, and uh, during these special times of need. I want you to look in your Bible if you have it with you, we've been going through a series. I've titled this series, Hope and Heartache. Hope and Heartache. And we think about the subject of hope. I, found, I, I actually had taken a well-known portion of Scripture, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 10, all the way really down to verse number 20. And I've broken it down into several messages. This particular message, obviously, from the title on the screen and what uh, Dr. Brandick read a few minutes ago, is the area of contentment, an area that we all struggle with. I really struggle with this. You know, I, I, not, we always have a, an idea that something, uh, you know, is, is out there that we need to gain. And I'm not, I'll talk about what that means in a minute, but we're talking about the area of contentment. And I want you to look what it says in verse number 11, please. The Apostle Paul is writing from the church at Philippi, to the church of Philippi, from a prison in Rome. He's gone through great heartache and discouragement. In this particular time of history, if you were in a Roman prison, as I mentioned last week, if you were in a Roman prison, what would happen would be if you wanted to eat, you wanted any provisions that had to be brought to you. The modern-day equivalent would be this. If you have a, someone in the Erie County prison, they starve to death unless their family would bring them food. The Apostle Paul had ministered to several churches and other Christians, but they were absent. But the small little church at Philippi in Macedonia would provide their needs, even though they would be known as the poorest of all churches. And Paul wrote this thank you letter, and that's what really Philippians is. It's an epistle, a letter, a thank you letter to the church at Philippi. And then he goes on and explains various issues from chapter 1, 2, 3. And in verse 4 is kind of the closing of this letter. And look at verse number 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have... What's the next word? mm mm experience right i have learned whatsoever state i am therewith to be say it please content i want to preach a message i've simply titled this morning contentment or contentment brings hope can we pray together please dear heavenly father we thank you for the opportunity you give us we thank you for this time we have together. And Lord, I pray for our people, those who are out of town, those who are maybe sick this morning, watching, those that 
family and friends watching maybe all over the country or wherever they may be, that, Lord, you would speak to all of us. First of all, Lord, I pray you speak to me. The area of contentment. And Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct in this message. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And let my words be your words. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul says here, Not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, he will go on later to explain, I've been full, I've had provisions, I've had an abundance, I've had more than I need, I've experienced those days. Some of you would like to say, I would like a few more of those days right now, right? And we've had that, we've had abundance. But I've also had where I was hungry, and I needed provisions. And we understand that whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Now, I'll explain in a minute what contentment, biblical contentment is in a minute. But let me say what it's not. Because many people, even some in the Christian church, will lecture people on the area of contentment. When you try to do something new or you try to better yourself, they'll say, you're not being content. Contentment is not laziness. It's not tr it doesn't mean you're not trying to better yourself. It doesn't mean you're trying to move in a different direction. And some people get the idea that just sitting still and doing nothing or the status quo is contentment. That's not what he's talking about, and that's not what this message is about. Contentment. But contentment is about knowing where you are with Christ, knowing your position with the Lord, and knowing God has put you here, and this is where you need to be. That's contentment. Let me explain to you. How many are scatterbrained like me? Raise your hand. You know, you're over here, over here, over here. You know, it's like you're here, you're here, you're here. Contentment is saying, God says, I'm going to put some stuff in your life. I'm going to put some people in your church that's going to really aggravate you so you can be content. <laughs> you know, I'm just teasing, of course. Well, not really, but anyway. So I'm going to understand that. And you just got to be, as Dave Ramsey says, there's the tortoise and there's the hare. How many of you remember that story? You've heard me say the tortoise and the hare. And guess who always wins? The who? The tortoise. Because the hare is over here, over here, over here, over here, bouncing around and sleeping and going over here and gets all disjointed. But the tortoise just says, I'm going on. It's like when my wife and I ran the marathon back in um, Charlotte this past year. You know, I'm sitting there and I know you just got to start slow. It's a long haul. You know, you don't start out. And you see it. And I remember getting toward the end, not that I'm did well or anything, but I saw people, this one fell off, that fell off, because you just got, it's a long track to 26.2. And the point I'm making today is that what contentment is, and it's not the area of complacency. It's not the area of complacency. And he goes on, Paul is bearing his heart to the church. One of the keys in the area of contentment is understanding where Christ is in your life. It's like this. There was an airline pilot fly, uh, flying over to the Tennessee mountains, and he pointed to a lake. A, an airline pilot was flying over the Tennessee mountains and pointed out a lake to his co-pilot. See that little lake, he said? When I was a kid, I used to sit in a rowboat on that lake fishing. Every time a plane would fly overhead, I'd look up and wish I was flying it. Now I look down and wish I was on the rowboat. Contentment, ladies and gentlemen, can be very elusive, an elusive pursuit. We go after that what we think will make us happy, only to find out it didn't work. In fact, we were happy before we ever started the quest. It's like an old story. Somebody said there were two teardrops floating down the river of life. One teardrop said to the other, who are you? I'm a teardrop from a girl who loved a man and losty. Who are you? He said to the other teardrop. I said to the other teardrop, I'm a teardrop from a girl who got him. If you understand that story. So guess what? 
In Philippians, I'm not good at telling jokes. Just stay where you are. You know, sometimes you ever hear somebody tell a joke and say, that, man, that'll preach. Or that'll, it works into the message. You look at it and they're going, really? All right. But we find out in the book of Philippians, this is a thank you note. The Philippian church had sent a financial gift to Paul. He was a prisoner. He wanted to express his heartfelt thanks. He didn't want to give the impression that the Lord was not sufficient in every need. That's where he goes on and speaks in verse number 14. Notwithstanding, you have done well that you did communicate or you did give with my affliction. But contentment. I found this quote. It was interesting. If your ship never comes in, if your dream never comes true, if the situation never changes, could you be happy? If not, then you're living in the clause of discontentment. And I think we all struggle with that. I do as well. Contentment doesn't mean that you don't feel the pain of your suffering. I found that out this week with my mom and my dad and my brother. Watching is just really hard. And we love them. I mean, my dad is in a phenomenal place. I mean, the Lord had provided through some insurance proceeds they had, and they bought a policy for long-term care. They got the best care in the world. It's unbelievable. But yet it's hard. How do you look at that? Some of you have gone through the same. Contentment doesn't mean you're not allowed to cry out to God or to your friends in Christ. It doesn't mean, oh, well, just suffering Jesus, that's where you are. Don't ever lecture anybody that way. Please don't say that to me. It's only by crying out to God and faith and submission that you know, I believe you'll find contentment. God brings you into a state. And can I say this? Contentment cannot, it's not a gift from God. Look here, it's something that you have to learn. It's not something some people are gifted with and some aren't. Some people, by the way, think they're gifted with contentment when they're really just lazy and they don't do anything. And they're content to always be in neutral their entire life. That's not biblical contentment at all. In fact, that's a sin. What we're talking about is accepting your situation, knowing that God's at work, and you're not like a scatterbrain bouncing off the walls trying to try something new to relieve the pain. What is contentment? Let's look at it quickly. Go back to verse number 11, please. Verse number 11. He says there, not that I speak in respect of one. He says, not that I have a desire, not that I need your help, but I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. The dictionary definition of contentment is the state of being mentally and emotionally satisfied with things as they are. Turn to Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter 6. I want you to turn there real quickly. Matthew chapter 6. Look what it says in verse number 25. I don't believe I have this on the screen, so you'll need to look that up. Matthew 6, 25. Jesus gave what I believe a, a great definition of this, or at least the story of that in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In Matthew chapter five, 6, he goes on and says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment, or clothing? Contentment. Hebrews 13 says this, Let your conversation, that would be your testimony, be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. Hebrews 13, 5. It says, For I have, for he have said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and will not fear what man shall do unto me. Contentment does not mean self-sufficient. It's just the opposite. It doesn't mean complacency or laziness. There's nothing wrong with a Christian working better to improve his circumstances and opportunity through maybe jobs or education. That's, that's obviously, that's not a disobeying contentment. You ought to do that. In fact, it's laziness not to do that. I talked to our children when we were raising our kids. I said, you know, reach for the high. Reach for something high. Move, move forward. Always be trying to, 
move your life forward with Christ. And contentment is not just sitting there saying, well, I'm going to chew on it for a decade or two. But maybe it requires you to be still for a while and not do something too. You'll learn contentment. And we'll go on later. If you're in an unpleasant job, there's nothing wrong with going back to school to train for something or making a change or something like that. And I want to put a plug in for tonight's message. Tonight's message, we've been going through 1 Corinthians chapter. We're going to be going through 1 Corinthians. We're going to go through chapter 7. And believe it or not, it just happens to be that we land on this position today, this morning. And tonight, the subject is contentment in your marriage. And we'll talk about that. And I believe everybody ought to be aware of that. And if you're a young person or you're not married or you're single, this would be a good thing for you as well to hear tonight. Contentment in your marriage. Contentment is a, and I put here, is an inner, peace, inner sense of rest or peace that comes from being right with God and knowing that He is in control of everything that happens to us. By the way, that's hard sometimes, isn't it? Have you ever been in a situation you just want to shout out and do something? Man, I just want to. I got to do something. I can't just sit here. Anybody like that? You're fidgety. You know, I'm the type of kid that was at the table and I'm rocking back and forth, rocking on my chair. My mom reminds me of all that stuff, by the way. She reminds me of the story. says, yeah, you're the type. I was changing your brother's diapers and you went in and got all the baby food jars. Remember baby food jars? I guess I still have those today, right? Everything's in squeezed plastic bottles now. But anyway, got all the baby food jars and you put all the baby food jars in the washing machine while I was washing your brother's diapers and I found that the whole thing's full of baby food. You was you just so fidgety. God bless my mom. I had one of our children that paid me back for that, all right? <laughs> anyway. Contentment is an inner sense of rest or peace that comes from being right with God. Contentment also means not being battered around by difficult circumstances or people or wrongly seduced by prosperity because that's what the goal is. Contentment. So how do we acquire it? How do we get it? Well, let's look at what, see what scriptures say here for a moment. I want you to look at verse number 13. Verse number 13. First of all, contentment comes from your focus. What are you really focused on? As you're focused about getting more stuff, then you'll never, never be content. This week, we were driving around parts of areas of Florida, and, you know, everything's gated. Everything has, you know, the big mansions on the, on the uh, big bed houses on the uh, on the ocean and it's always seems like we got to get more we got to get more we got to get more they did a study recently that they studied the greatest generation the greatest generation would be the generation before me those who fought in world war ii we have a handful in here that are still uh, that were part of the greatest generation are those that fought fought in the second world war possibly the korean war and after they um fought the war, they had babies, it would be the baby boomers, which would be, I'm at the very end of the baby boomer line, the baby boomer generation ended around 1964, I was born, I know you can't believe this, but I was actually born in 1960, wow, pastor, I thought you were like, you know, I didn't know you were that old, yeah, I really am, I promise you, anyway, but anyway, that was a joke too, and that didn't work either, anyway, <laughs> but they, they studied, and here's what they found out, that the greatest generation, the greatest generation, they did a, a development on Long Island, and it was kind of the prototype for the suburbs, and it was called Levittown, New York. It was right outside Long Island. They did a, 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 they did a, 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 a study there, and they said that the baby boomers, when they had children back in the late 40s, 50s, early 60s, when they had children, the average size home there was 1,200 to 1,300 square feet, three bedrooms, and get this, please, one bath. Now, you would think you're being sent to a third world country with no electricity if you tell a young family today you've got to get in a 1,300 square foot home with, th with four kids and one bathroom. That is torture. I had three girls. I know what that's like, right? My dad used to be funny when he raised us kids. He'd get so tired of the, being in the shower so long in the hot water, he'd go turn the thing off. Try that for a change, right? 
But anyway, contentment, it seems like we always have more, bigger, 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 more, more, more. And now the new home, average size square foot home for the typical millennial couple buying a home between 35 and 40 is close to 3,000 square feet, and most are bigger. So we've tripled, almost tripled the square footage. We've having less kids and more stuff, and that's still not enough. Now, before we go throwing stones at our culture, aren't we that way too? We all are. Say contentment is not focusing on what you have and what you don't have. Contentment is your focus on the Lord. Look at Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Strengtheneth me. Hmm. Focusing on happiness and pleasure, you're going to come back empty-handed. Time has been wasted, money is gone, and discouragement is set in. If you focus on Christ and others and helping others, I'm telling you, there's something that God does in your heart. By the way, if you focus on what others have, they'll always have more, they always can do more, and they always seem really happy. A man went to a pastor and for counseling, and he was in the midst of a financial collapse. He said, I've lost everything. He was weeping to his pastor. And the pastor said, oh, no, I'm sorry to hear they've lost your faith. No, I haven't lost my faith. Well, then I'm sad to hear that you've lost your character. No, I haven't lost my character. And he says, I'm sorry to hear that you lost your salvation. No, that's not what I said. I haven't lost my salvation. And the pastor looked over to the man and said, you have your faith, your character, and your salvation. Seems to me you've lost none of the things that really matter. John Stott writes the following. I don't know if you can read that. It's somewhat small font. But he said the following. I, I wanted to get this out because this is so good. It helps us. Contentment is the secret of inward peace. It remembers the stark truth that we brought nothing into the world and we will take certain and we can take nothing out of them out of it life in fact is a pilgrimage from one moment of nakedness to another isn't that good so we should travel light and live simply our enemy is not possessions but excess do you hear that our battle cry is not nothing but enough We've got enough. Simplicity says if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that, end quote. The apostle Paul was in prison. He was unable to pursue his tent-making trade. He was in a tight spot, and he writes this letter. He wrote letters to the, book of, to the church at Ephesus, Colossians, and Philemon, and to Philemon. And he asked for prayers in those letters. And sometimes God supplied him abundantly. And so Paul had learned how to live in prosperity. But sometimes God withheld support. And Paul had to learn how to get along with humble means. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The second, and this is all, we don't like this. You got to go to the school of how to learn to be content. It's not the gift. Oh, God, it's not one of the gifts of the Spirit. Well, I have the gift of contentment. Have you ever heard anybody say, I haven't heard that, but maybe some people say that. No, contentment is learned. How many of you learned a few things over the years? Raise your hand. How many of you would not do something you did because of what you, you've learned some things, you would not go there again? Anybody like that besides me? All right. Some people in our Financial Peace University, and we do Dave Ramsey here, you, they have had all this experience of financial mess, and they've learned we're not going back there again. It's a learned thing. They had to go through some troubles. Philippians 4.11 says this, not that I speak 
aspect of one, I have learned. And we talked about it. And whatsoever state I am, there would be content. The whole world is learning. The word there is learning. I've learned to be content because I've previously not been content. It's like people who invest, and I'm not going to get into investment strategy. I don't, I don't really believe that's appropriate here, but people who make investments, they're jumping in the market, out of the market, in the market, out of the market. They're trying to time it. What a bunch of nonsense. And somebody said the only people that get hurt on a roller coaster are those who get off before the ride's over. Finish the ride. <laughs> a little secret there at long-term investing for those of you who know where I'm going. I had a family member. How many of you familiar with what's going on with Bitcoin? Anybody heard of Bitcoin? Raise your hand. Bitcoin, you know, it's up, it's up, it's up. And I said, don't get near that stuff. By the way, let me just give you a secret. And this is not just investing. It's not in the, if you can't explain something to me in one sentence, don't buy it. What is this stuff? Well, it's a dark web coin that you can, invest. Ugh. but anyway, here's the point. People are never content because there's always something they never get to. And the Apostle Paul says, I've gone through pains and sorrows. Well, whatever the crosses you're bearing today are the things he's used to teach you something. Hebrews 12, 11 talks about the chastening. Look what it says. Now, Joe, chastening for the present seemed to be joy. If how many of you had a trial? He says, I'm so glad I'm going through this. Oh, Lord, I can't wait for another trial to teach me. That's crazy. But guess what? God teaches us, doesn't he? You ever learn something? Nevertheless, I love that word, right? Aren't you glad for the neverthelesses or the buts? <laughs> Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Aren't you glad God allowed you to go through this to teach you something? Your yield is contentment. Sometimes people say, I'll be happy, happy when my husband makes more money, when my kids are raised, when we get the new house, when we go on the dream vacation. Never happens, does it? 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says this, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some. Don't we start a lot of comparing ourselves with others? Sometimes we gossip about people because they got stuff or things or maybe even a spouse that we start comparing our spouse. Listen, God gave you that spouse. But measuring ourselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not what? Why? Stop it. When I was in the business world, we had a controversy that erupted in the company. And I worked for a mid-sized company. We had about 240 employees in our particular division that I was working in. Somehow, a computer printout got out what everybody was making. It was a train wreck. And everybody started comparing their salary to the, what a mess. And I'm not going to try to act super spiritual, but I said, really, it's none of your business. If you don't like it, go find another job. I can't believe, listen, it was a mess because they were comparing themselves to others. And before we get all bent out of shape about something and we say that's terrible, don't we do that? Don't we do that? So what are some practical things you and I can do? By the way, where's your walk with the Lord? Where's Jesus Christ in any of this? Back in 1999, 2000, 2001, there was a, a phrase that a lot of the young people, my kids were young then, they would use, and it said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I thought that, you know, that's not a bad thing to think. What would Jesus do? How would he handle this? It made you think. What would he do? What would he do? Paul learned to be content in all conditions. There was a Jewish man, man in Hungary, the country Hungary, who went to his rabbi and complained, life is unbearable. There are nine of us living in one room. What can I do? The rabbi answered this Jewish man. He said the following thing, take your goat into the room with you 
and I'll tell you what to do later. The man was pretty upset. He was incredulous, but he did as the rabbi said. A week later, the man returned. He was distraught. Then before, he says, I can't stand it, he told the rabbi. The goat is filthy. And he says, okay, go home and let the goat out and come back in a week. A week later, the man returned, radiant and exclaiming, life is beautiful. We enjoy every minute of each other because there's no goat in the room. It all is on your perspective. The steps to commitment, commitment, contentment, rather, the first one is step into the path Becoming content is to recognize that being content is not something God gives you. You're going to have to learn it. You guys know the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Isn't that what we do? But something we must learn and put into practice. One commentator said this, do not pray for contentment. God, please make me content. God's reply will be, no, you make yourself content. That's what Paul said. Notice he said, our text is, I have learned to be content. Just as we discovered the first principle in our life is about sin, we can't be content with sin. For a believer, that comes from conviction from God, but contentment is a learned one. Step two, we find, is the next step, of a Christian contentment is to be able to distinguish from those things that are eternal. Oh, this is important. Don't miss this one. From those things that are temporal. How many got all wrapped up in stuff or things and you look back and go, really, that really wasn't that important now, right? I use the illustration at Christmas time. Parents that go into debt in the Visa and Master Charge to buy plastic that ends up in the Summit County landfill. And it looked all important on Christmas Day, but now, just in about 60 days, there are going to be Christmas presents will start showing up there. Temporal. What is important in your life? Do your kids love the Lord? I tell this to parents. I say, do parents, do you, is your first goal in your life to get your kids stuff, or is it your first goal in your life to bring them unto a knowledge of Jesus Christ and they'll walk with him. That ought to trump everything. I'm all for sports. I mean, my kids play sport. We don't let them play one sport. So you pick one, you can play one sport. This stuff of playing sports year-round, sports, 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 sports. And that there's a train wreck of young adults out there that all they did was run from one ball game to another, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because you're not a good parent unless your kids are involved in everything. And I've watched them. I've seen them. My generation's got all these kids. They played ball. They did this. They did that. And by the way, none of them are ever going to do it for a living. I got a kid one time upset. He said, he's a great basketball player. He says, I'm going to score 1,000 points. And says, you're in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is a little bitty town nobody cares about. You're in a basketball league. Even though you're the best player in that league, you're never going to amount to anything. You will never get a Division I scholarship. And if, if you make it, just say by the lottery, you hit it and get a Division I scholarship, you're never going to do this rest of your life. Concentrate on something more than ball. You'd have thought I was telling him to cut off his arm. Where is the Lord in all this? Where is he? By the way, can I tell you this? At least experience for me, when you're plowing through with contentment, Everybody look here. I'm just speaking from experience. 19 years of pastoring as a father of a 30, 30 year old? 32. She's 32. Oh, wow. I'm really old. By the way, we got married at 12. My wife had Trisha at 13. <laughs> anyway, I know we look that way, but this doesn't. Can I say, when you are content, you're going to be out in front of the group. And sometimes it gets really lonely because nobody's with you. <laughs> Step three. By the way, the, the text I want to write down is 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Interesting. For we brought nothing into this world, as John Stott quoted, and it's certain we will carry nothing out. 
Let me give you the modern day version of that. You're not going to carry the U-Haul behind the hurts. You're taking nothing with you. Step three. Develop a grateful attitude. It's really impossible to be discontent when you're grateful. Colossians 1, if you want to write this down, verse 12 and 14, give it thanks to the Father which has made us which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us in the kingdom of his dear Son, and whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. You know a Bible study? Talk in the, read, do a Bible study on the issue of gratefulness and praise. You know why God's word has so much in there? Because we get really discontent. Look at the screen. So what is the it? I put the it in quotes. So what am I asking you to know here tonight, this morning? Contentment has to be learned. We studied, we studied that. What is your focus on? Is your focus on what others have and don't have? What somebody else's spouse is like, if my spouse isn't like that, really? We'll talk about that tonight a little bit. Contentment is learned through tough times. Honestly, I'm going through that right now with my dad and my mom. I can tell you as the pastor of this church, I can tell you with unequivocally, I have no intention of resigning or leaving. This is where God's put us. But I may have to travel a little bit. I'm struggling with that. But contentment is based upon an internal perspective. One thing about getting old is you can look back and say, wow, that really wasn't that important. Contentment is developed through a grateful attitude. I proof text every one of these points through Philippians and Scripture this morning. You know, we've got dozens of people that aren't here this morning they either came at one time or another because they're discontent. They're aggravated with somebody. They don't like the situation they're in. Sometimes it's a health concern. And the devil won. And the devil won. This morning, I want us to praise God. And let's have a grateful attitude. My son-in-law and daughter were with us for a little bit of time this week. Well, most of the time. And they went to a, um, they went to Kenya to an orphanage. And they were showing us pictures of the orphanage. All the kids' heads were shaved because, boys and girls, because of lice. We get lice here, we freak out like somebody's got the bubonic plague. And I understand I don't like lice. I'm you know, not saying that. <laughs> The house, my daughter said, was, you looked at it, and some of us said, you're going to sleep there? They went to this lady who was a grandmother. She had all these children. The, the father and mother died, and they had to give their kid away to the orphanage. My son and daughters adopted this child, not here in the United States, but they send financial gifts, and his name is Joseph. And we looked at little Joseph, and he showed his face. He's so excited. My daughter says, we're going to put money away so he can go to college in, in, um, in Kenya if we're going to try to help when he gets older, to give him a college education. And he loves the Lord, and they're talking about that. Well, they went to Joseph's grandmother's house, and I'll close with this. And they were Joseph's grandmother's house. Joseph's grandmother was, was so poor. It was, it was a dirt, really, just a bricks and dirt and, 
it was, it was, we'd look at it and we'd kind of wince. And then she brought him a chicken. And they said, no, 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 we don't want that chicken. She says, no, it would be an insult because she was giving them all that she had for taking her grandson and putting him in the orphanage. And they went home that night and they slayed or wring the chicken's neck and they ate that chicken because that was all she had to give. And I guess what I learned from that from Colleen and John, and it hit us between the eyes. You have to learn to be content and praise God for what we do have. Let's all stand together, please, with every head bowed and every eye closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ.